In some villages in Africa, groups of orphans gather together to form their own families. They come together to build each other houses out of the mud until every one of them has a home. This is what community looks like. This is the church in action, and we get a chance to live that life. Come get your hands dirty. The famous phrase of the church in Lent is, from ashes we were made, or dust we were made, and to dust we shall return. This is the journey you and I are on made by dust, alive for a little bit, and then to one day, to dust, you and I will go back. The Hebrew word for dust or dirt or ground is Adam, Adam, and Adam from Adam and Eve, of course, comes from that root. You and I are nothing but clay, and to clay we shall return. What I marvel at in both a kind of a horrible way and, and a joyful way, is what we can do with this body of ours. This clay can be filled with the Holy Spirit to do amazing things, like we saw on the screen, build houses in Haiti. It can also quite horrifically pull triggers of assault rifles and murder our children. And we've seen both of that this week. It hurts to know that we're just ashes in a certain degree, and it hurts to know we are capable of such beauty and such evil. And I just ask myself, Jesus, what is it that we can do? We're such a mixture of the, the common and the broken and the sinful and the weak, and yet by your Holy Spirit, you guide us and just lift us up. And when that happens, it's amazing. But how are we? What are we supposed to say, Jesus? What are we supposed to do when we see the extremes of which we are capable? And how do you, Jesus, work that out in us? It just seems like we're such a mess. And this world is so incredibly broken. My son is 19. He's, his birthday is today. I know there's no chance he's watching this. It's way too early. That would be a miracle. But I just think about being 19. Did any of you have it figured out at 19? No. And if you did, you're nuts. We've got therapists who would love to talk to you. But I'm just thinking, I think about the messages the world sent him at 19. You can vote, you can join the armed forces, but you can't buy a beer or get a rental car. You can buy a gun, but you can't do this and you can't do that. At 19, and what, what a confused, chaotic symphony that is of just complete discord to send a message to our youngest. You can't do this and you can't do that. And I don't want to get into the policies of this necessarily today, but it, it amazes me just the confusion that our world sends us. And Jesus is to be an antidote to this, and so is his church. And so what are we to say? I think what we say is, from ashes we came, and to ashes we return. And in the middle, we have to be completely guided by God. Completely guided by the Holy Spirit, because we need our creator, and we need Christ so desperately. I saw that Ash Wednesday. I saw it all over. I'm still kind of reeling from Ash Wednesday. It was a spirit-filled, powerful day. In the morning and the evening, I was dressed in my robe and stole in full Methodist regalia, and 
I know, I felt important, you know? <laughs> Bright colors, silk, you know, flowing robes. People were driving by because we did ashes outside and they thought either he's a pastor or this is Harry Potter's new set. We don't know which. <laughs> Lots of double looks. When did I, just, did I just see who is that, you know? We caused several accidents, but none of them are suing us, thank the Lord. No, we didn't. It's okay. But we did a drive-by Ash Wednesday thing. Again, not my preference is people would actually commend the church, but that doesn't always happen. And so we took this year at First Methodist Houston the ashes to them, and we had a sign out front and said, pull over if you want to have ashes dispensed you know, in your car. And from 5 to 7 p.m., I was out there on Wednesday, and we had cars stop about every two to three minutes. It was amazing. Huh? Most of whom had no idea our church was here. They didn't. And uh, they do now. And, but it was amazing. It's like this, this one car pulled over, and SUV, and... Roll down the windows, and there's two women in there, and they say, are you dispensing ashes? I said, I am. And they went, yes, party, party, party. They did. They did. I said, could you please come to the 11 o'clock service downtown? <laughs> I did not say that. But you know, I said, yes, are you interested? And they dispensed ashes, and, and they said, thank you so much for doing this. We're just... So grateful that you would take the time just to pause and make this possible for us. I said, you bet, you bet, so glad to do it. And another car came, it was filled with Rockets fans, and the Rockets were playing the Sacramento Kings, you know, on Wednesday night. I don't even know if we won the game, did we? If, if God's plan prevailed, we did. But uh, Rockets fans, and so these, these, this family, two, two, two parents and two kids get up and they're in full Rockets gear, and, uh, and they said, we're not members of your church, can you, can, but can we have ashes? I said, you bet. They said, oh, thank you so much. They said, we saw what you were doing. We missed it. And we actually made the block so that we could come back around and, and see if, if this would be possible for us. I said, you bet. So we dispensed the ashes, and they said, thank you so much. And they looked at me and said, go Rockets. And I said, amen. <laughs> and then... In front of 17,000 people, they, in a small way, got to be a witness to what really matters in Toyota Center, and I've been to Toyota Center before. It's not exactly the house of all righteousness, is it? But it got a little bit of that on Ash Wednesday because of First Methodist Houston, and I thought that was great to see. My favorite story from Ash Wednesday was a mom comes, and again, not a member of her church, and and uh, uh, she's in an SUV, and she lowers the window, and I introduce myself and do the ashes, and, you know, remember from whence you came, and, and, um, and there's kind of a moment there, and, and then I hear this little voice from the back seat that said, I want to follow Jesus too, and so mom said, would you, would it be possible for my daughter? I said, you bet, so I step back to the, the rear seat, and the window goes down, and there's a girl, little girl, in a car seat, and I said, what's your name? She told me. I said, how old are you? And she said, I'm five. And uh, we dispensed the ashes, and um, I stepped back from that, and I look at mom. There are tears streaming down her face, and she drives to work, and I assume the little girl goes to school. To me, just to me, maybe to you, Moments like that are where we touch together our frailty and our great common need for God. And we were able to do that in a small way here at the intersection of Maine and Clay on Ash Wednesday, as we've done similar things in Christ's name at this very place for a long time now. But it's experiences like that. It's moments like that where we realize just how common we are. 
when we put aside the, the labels that we wear or the, the, the insignificant paraphernalia that we surround ourselves with, when we hear Jesus' words that every possession we have will rust and fade and the moth will get, none of it matters. None of it matters at all. The only thing that matters is that we are dust and to dust that we shall return and we have great need for the gospel of Jesus Christ and a relationship with him. It's the only thing that matters at all. And Lent, Ash Wednesday, which begins, is the time where we get about that message, realizing how much we have in common how frail we are, how broken we are, how sinful we all are. And in that commonality of our fragility, if you will, we find we share much with each other and have a great need, as I've said before, of our relationship with Christ. There's nothing more important than that. The tragedy, perhaps, is is how easy it is to forget. And... We put other things first, idolatry. We um, start treating people as possessions. We lie, we break, we just, we screw up. And as we do, it's, you know, we have a need to return to this, again, just sort of baseline of our faith that we are fragile, we are broken, and the only hope we have is truly in Jesus. And when we lay hold of that and don't let go, then God has the capacity to do something great in us. Another story. We have a walk to Emmaus that's going on this weekend. Walk to Emmaus is a retreat for men and women, and I would describe it as, as it's for people who know Jesus, but not always, but kind of want a deeper exposure to the Christian faith. And uh, my wife and I, Deborah, we've both been on it, and, and they're just are great believers, and uh, we have a walk to Emmaus that's going on now, and uh, some of our men uh, are on it, but uh, a lot of our men are helping to lead it. I was out there yesterday, and uh, it's, being, um, it, it's being led by a, a guy in our church that many of you know, Jeff Aldis, and, and uh, I want to tell a story about Jeff, and I've not cleared this with him because sometimes in the church it's better to ask forgiveness than permission, so we'll step onto that fragile ground. And uh, I don't think he'd mind, though. And um, um, Jeff was, has been known he's going to lead this walk for a number of months. And uh, about, I don't know, two months ago, uh, uh, well, first, he, he asked me to give a talk at it on sin, and he said, because I wanted you to have a topic that you knew the most about. I said, thank you, Jeff. And then I said, Lord, bless and keep Jeff far away from me. There we go. Anyway, just kidding. But uh, Jeff, uh, he, he sends me an email and, and uh, actually a text too, and he's panicking. And he's, he's going to say, Andy, he's like, I'm leading this walk to Emmaus, and we've got this great team. It's amazing, and nobody is signed up. I am leading the walk to Emmaus to nowhere for nobody. So what are we going to do? <laughs> so, uh, Jeff, we're going to pray. We're just going to pray, and, and God will move. Just watch, just watch, just watch. And uh, so anyway, sure enough, people do sign up, about 30. And um, I'm driving to church this morning, and, and uh, uh, anyway, my phone goes off. It's a text, and it's from Jeff. And he said, I just wanted you to know, but one of the guys on our walk has had a powerful experience, and, and, uh, and he asked to be baptized this morning. And he said yes to Jesus for the first time at about 8 o'clock today. He said, I just wanted you. Yeah. He said, I wanted you to know. And uh, I text him back. It's like, Eamon, Jeff, so excited. Just, you know, because when things like that happen, like, you know, kind of the woman and the daughter in the car, when things like that happen, it, you know, I, I don't know what goes on in heaven. I won't make any, any pretense to know. But something tells me that that guy who was baptized this morning when when all is said and done and, and, and he's in heaven, he, he's, he's going to go find Jeff Aldis. And he's going to say, thanks. And he's going to go find every person who helped make this weekend possible and say, thank you. 
because it's just that kind of basic experience that when we have it and share it together and God moves in us, we just realize again how much we need Jesus. We're frail, we're broken, we're sinful, we're shallow, we're petty, we gossip, we do all these horrific things, but we come to an awareness that we don't have to live this way and what an offer we have from Jesus Christ. And when we say yes to that, everything begins to change. And, you know, as I was, I was on the street Ash Wednesday and cars were going by. And to be honest, you know, at the start of the day, I had never done this before as far as like outside the church, driving by, that sort of thing. Never done it before. And, <laughs> and I, you know, I just said, Lord, is anybody going to show up? And sure enough, they did. And so after hundreds of people go by and you know, after hearing the stories from Jeff Aldis, the walk to Emmaus, baptisms, things like that. You know, where I'm, I'm left standing today is just how aware we need to be that this city that we live in has a great need for Jesus. And there are millions of people who desperately desire to have a connection to their creator. There are hundreds and hundreds of thousands of families and parents and children who are wondering if God has a plan for them and in desperate need of things like forgiveness and redemption and hope and strength, all these things that are the pillars of the church. And were we to get a little more aggressive, were we to get a little more, mm, I don't know what the right is, prayerful, if we were to get a little more determined to tell the world about what the life is that is found in Jesus Christ, it is a world that is ready to receive and has great need if we are just willing to take the steps to proclaim the message. And I pray that this Lent, you and I and your families and your kids are. It is time to speak the gospel of Jesus Christ, to act it out, because we live in a world that needs to know and, as I saw Wednesday, is hungry for it. Amen? Amen. Now, we don't need to have an attitude about it. We don't need to be arrogant about it. We don't need to get a little, you know, kind of a Christian cocky swagger about it. That's right out. Because as soon as we do things like that, we're the hypocrites Jesus speaks of. When we go, when we talk, when we act, we do so as a servant. And actually, actually, the word servant in the New Testament it's really not so much, I think it's a mistranslation really in modern Bibles today. The word is honestly, if we were to be truthful about it, is slave. I am a slave to Christ. I am a slave to what the Holy Spirit asked of me. We translate it as servant today, but it's really what the word is. We go forward humbly. So what I hope for is that as we start Lent together and as we think about how to practice Lent, both individually as a church, that we do two things which may appear contradictory, but I think Jesus has something good in mind for us in the sense that we have this powerful message. We have these powerful experiences of God. We celebrate the baptisms of people. We see, and it was, again, it was just amazing. I'd put the ashes on, on people I didn't even know. And they, I would say in, in many cases, just tears streaming down their face at just this powerful moment. We live in a world where these things happen and the Holy Spirit guides us to these moments. But when they happen... We have to remember that humility is a must because while we're there and it's a powerful moment, all we can really do is put the oxygen right and the fuel in the room. It's the Holy Spirit that lights the spark. And so it's to God that goes all the glory for moments like that. Tremendously powerful. But Jesus asks us to be tremendously humble in return because it's not because of us. It's because of who him, right? That's the key. So Jesus tells us, when you give alms, don't sound a trumpet. Don't go bragging. 
Don't get on Twitter and talk about what a holy and righteous person you are. That's not in the gospel, but it's a modern paraphrase. Don't trumpet it before others. He said, be humble so that you may know, your God knows, right, that when you give alms, your Father knows what you're doing. You don't need to boast and brag about it. It doesn't mean that you don't need to let anybody know, but do so in a humble kind of way. Whenever you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogue and on the street corners so that they may be seen by others. Truly, I tell you, they receive their reward. But whenever you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your Father who is in secret. Your Father who sees in secret will reward you. What's Jesus going for there? What's he after? And really what I think it is, is not so much the mechanics of it. Jesus doesn't want us to just shut ourselves in the room and pray every time we pray, although we can. What, what Jesus is looking for here is humility. Be about a humble way to pray. Recognize that your ability to pray itself comes from God, not because of you. Realize that you are being powered by the Holy Spirit to even utter the words or have the thought. It's that kind of humbleness that Jesus is going for. Then Jesus talks about fasting, another Lenten discipline. And, you know, I don't know, many of us, I would imagine, have never done it. And I would just encourage you to say, okay, we're here at the start of Lent. And Easter is about, you know, five, six weeks out. And if you have never fasted, Would it be a time to take this on? Notice in the scriptures that Jesus says, when you fast, right? It's an assumed, not if, or if you thought about it, or kind of should have, but when you fast. Now, mercifully, I'll say that John Wesley, founder of the United Methodist Church, he said that fasting should be rare. Amen? (laughs) Right? Sometimes it's good news we have in the gospel. Fasting should be rare, and he also said it should be short. Amen? There you go. So here's what you do. You know, uh, evening's coming around and you go to Whataburger and have whatever you want, right? Have dinner. Then the next day, skip breakfast, skip lunch. I do, uh, confessionally, give myself a little bit of an out and say I can have zero calorie beverages, i.e. coffee. A fasting without coffee for me is right out. Anyway, (laughs) breakfast, skip it lunch, skip it, and then have dinner the next day. And if you structure it, right, with a little early dinner the day before and a late dinner on the next day, you'll go 24 hours. I think, maybe after consulting with your physician, because I don't need Methodists passing out from hunger, but you ought to try it and skip a meal. We saw the video from Haiti, a house being built from one of the mission churches that our mission projects that our church has, has done. And you may be, maybe you've never been to Haiti. I would imagine most of us have never been there. But if you really want to get a glimpse of what it's like to live in Haiti, may I suggest that what you need is to be hungry. And if you are hungry, you will identify with what it's like to live in Haiti. Haiti, and you also will understand, again, this, rely, uh, this reliance we have to have on God, and that every time that hunger pain kicks in, you know, you'll hear two things. One is temptation, you know, go eat Cheetos, go eat Doritos, there are Twinkies in your pantry, go find them, you need them now. But then you'll also hear, it's like, there's a higher calling, and I know that as Jesus said when he was being tempted by the devil early in the Gospels, we do not live by bread alone. Something higher truly sustains us. So maybe fasting is something that you should do this land, that you should take on to spend 24 hours. I will also add to this, it's extremely essential you stay hydrated. So the more water you drink, the easier it'll be. But take it on. Now, when you do it, follow Jesus' example and that you don't need to go bragging about it. You don't need to go boasting about it. You don't need to get to like 3 o'clock in the afternoon and say, hey, everybody, look at me. Look at what I'm doing. I'm fasting and make a production out of it. No. 
But if somebody comes to you and says, what are you doing or why are you doing this? I think Jesus would say, certainly we could tell them. And as we swim upstream against what the culture would have us do, people will realize what an alternative life that is possible we have in following Jesus Christ, our Lord. You know, it's just kind of funny. It's, uh, you know, I was, I was in Central Market the other day shopping for food. And I, I don't know if there's another place that's as close to the Garden of Eden <laughs> as Central Market. Do you? I mean, it's just ridiculous. It is. I was in there the first time we went in there. It's like, I, cause I, you know, I like to cook, and I called Deborah, and I was just standing. It's like, you wouldn't believe this place. There are 27 kinds of apples in a row right here. I counted them all. And here's a picture of each kind. As we, and that's just the apples. I took my children there and said, I've never heard of this. What is this? Anyway, we went on the chocolate aisle. This is a true story. I'm going to go off the cuff. It's okay. But Anna was little, and there was a European chocolate section in I said, I'm going to buy Anna and Noah, I'm going to buy you each a candy from Europe, and you're going to try it. So I bought Anna Toblerone, true story. She had never had it. So I broke off a piece, and I, she, I said, Anna, here, try this. And she said, uh-uh, not doing it. I said, Anna, it's really good. Not doing it. Anna, it's really good. Not doing it. Finally, I forced the Toblerone down the kid's throat into her mouth. <laughs> I did, and say, you need to eat this. And she, tears are streaming down her face, and she says, it's really good. <laughs> Over <laughs> her tears. But we live in a culture where everything is possible, where everything is there, and there is such abundance. Doesn't it make sense for us to, in a Lenten season, to intentionally step away from that? And say, although it's here, and maybe, yes, I can afford it, it's a time to deny ourselves. Because what we need to remember, what we have to hold on to, is that from ashes we came, and to ashes we will return. And if we lose sight of that, we will get lost. But if we hold that as central to us, and we understand how Jesus came to guide us through this journey, then we will be okay, or at least stand a great chance of having a life that matters with the priorities that matters and, and, and living in a godly way. You know, Jesus lived in a time where he, he was amazingly disturbed by the hypocrisy of faith. He lived in a time where he looked at people and he thought they were just going through the motions. Another example of this would be when he saw the widow give into the treasury of the temple making her offering he was extraordinarily moved at her sacrifice because she gave all that she had, literally, and the wealthy of the day just gave a small pittance of what they could afford. It affected their standard of living, not at all, but they made a great production out of their gift. Jesus saw stuff like that, actions like that, and it made him sick. And so he preached about it, and he talked about it, and he called it out every time he saw it. We cannot be hypocrites in our faith, but what we can be is humble. And when we have powerful moments at the altar, when we have powerful moments of baptism, when we have that rare moment to be with somebody as they experience the presence of God, what we can be is humble. And give God the praise because it's moments like that that shape us. From ashes we came to ashes we shall return. But all will be well with Jesus Christ as our guide, our friend, and ultimately our Savior. All God's people said, Amen. Pray with me.